We have now entered into the part of our service where we allow God to teach us through his written work. Again, I've been asked by Josh to speak in his behalf, which I consider an honor. And he's leading the church through a series of Bible studies, um, starting with the Old Testament. We've gone through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and this week we are in the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament. I invite you to open up your Bible if you have it, or if you have your Bible on a phone app, go ahead and open that up. Uh, you can go all the way to Numbers uh, chapter 1 if you would like. I'm going to be referencing some other places at times, but we're going to spend a lot of time with Numbers chapter 13 and 14. But the title of the lesson today is simply The Book of Numbers, Keeping 40 Years from Becoming Forever. I'm a history teacher at San Mateo High School, and I love teaching, I love my students, but I especially love teaching history. Because history shows humanity. History shows us at different points of time. And humanity doesn't change. We are people of great strengths, of great pursuits as human beings. We seek to accomplish things. We seek to go places and do things. But we also, in our humanity, are people that are prone to great failures. And in studying history, we can study where mankind has done great things with its opportunities and nations have grown and succeeded. But we can also study times where there have been great failures, where people have simply not done what they should do. And not only have they hurt their own lives, but they've hurt the lives of many others. And the point is to learn from those experiences. Many lessons I've learned in life have been from my own failures, and those are the most painful. God does not want us to learn from our own failures all the time. He'd rather us learn from the failures of others that he's recorded or simply seeing what does not work in life and what leads to disaster and then choose the opposite. At times in even recent American history, we've learned from failure. I remember years ago in my early college years, receiving news over the college speaker system that the space shuttle Challenger had crashed. And probably everyone, if you were alive at that time, you remember that exact moment. A disaster where seven astronauts were killed and one of them was a teacher. And in the days to come, in the years to come, they would break down the failure that took place that did not have to take place. If people had simply listened to what others had said about a faulty design that was not equipped to work in the very cold weather that the shuttle launched in that day. NASA learned from failure. We learned from 9-11, the different areas where we're vulnerable as a country. We're learning with this virus today what ways we're vulnerable uh, to a virus coming into our country. We're learning the reality of what a pandemic can do. We have to learn from these things, or as one person said, we're doomed to repeat them. In the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, there's a powerful lesson from epic failure that Scripture tells us to go back to and visit. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. Again, here's what he says. For everything that was written in the past, that's history, was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Here, when the Apostle Paul was writing this, he was writing to Christians who lived in Rome. And when he talks about things that were written in the past, the only written past they had was their Old Testament scriptures. So that has to be what he's referring to. What we call the Old Testament today, they just call the scriptures. But he's saying here, these things are written to teach us. In other words, God, through his providence, he made sure these things are recorded so we could read them today. They read them 2,000 years ago in the first century as early Christians. We read them today for the same purpose. 
we're going to read about a failure today that we are susceptible to committing ourselves, but we don't have to commit. And that is losing everything that God intended for us to experience. We're going to look at four things today from the book of Numbers. First of all, we're going to see that the book of Numbers speaks to us today. Even though it's a relatively, uh, relatively obscure book, it speaks to us today. Uh, second, we'll look at some guides to understanding the book of Numbers. If you're reading it and you want to read the whole book, we'll look at some guides that will help shape your understanding. Then we're going to look thirdly at the key event in the book of Numbers. That is the failure itself, chapters 13 and 14. And then we'll look at the message for today from the book of Numbers. But first of all, I want to see this morning that the book of Numbers speaks to us today. It's not this obscure, irrelevant book of the Old Testament. It may not have immediate application in some places, and we'll talk about that. But it still speaks to us today. God recorded it for a purpose. The book of Numbers records a disaster. The book of Numbers records a disaster due to unbelief. That is, simply not believing in God, and it resulted in catastrophic failure. Like with the space shuttle, when the engineers from the company called Morton Thiokol had warned NASA that the O-rings and the main engine thrusters were going to fail at a certain uh, low temperature, they were not listened to. And they went ahead and launched the shuttle anyway. And on live television in front of the whole world, Seven astronauts were killed shortly after the shuttle completely exploded. And they even have pictures of where that O-ring was disintegrating even upon initial launch. They could break down the failure. We can do the same with the book of Numbers. A generation that experienced deliverance from slavery turns into a group of malcontents. That's what we see in Numbers. A group that experienced everything God had planned for them to deliver them from Egyptian slavery. These people that should have been appreciative and trusting in God instead complained against him and did not trust in him even at the moment when they were on the verge of receiving everything he intended. We also see in Numbers, discontent turned to disbelief and disobedience at the worst possible time. Discontent turned to disbelief and disobedience at the worst possible time. Right when they needed to trust God the most, they did just the opposite and ran the other direction. We can do the same today, and therefore Numbers speaks to us. In the book of Numbers, we find that instead of entering their promised destiny, the early nation of Israel was doomed to wander in a desert for 40 years until they died. So instead of going into the promised land, they went back into the desert. Lived there 40 years till that first generation died. They received the opposite of what God intended. Also from the book of Numbers, we find that this disaster is recorded in Scripture as a warning for us today. It is a shot across our spiritual bow. God doesn't want just this to be history to be dusted off, to be read, just to <clears throat> describe what happened. He wants us to learn from it. And it's recorded in significant places in the New Testament or cited. Also, as we recognize number speaks to us today, we recognize we can have it all and lose it all at the same time time. We can have it all and lose it all at the same time, but that does not have to happen. So the book of Numbers speaks to us today. Secondly, this morning, I want to talk about some guides, some guides to understanding this book. If you decide you're going to plunge into the deep end of the book of Numbers and you're going to start with chapter one all the way to the end, uh, 30 odd something chapters, you're engaging in a great undertaking. You're going to have some difficult parts to navigate, not impossible, just difficult, and uh, you're going to want to end up having learned from the book. So I want to present, uh, I think, five here, five guys to simply kind of getting your head around the book of Numbers. 
First of all, the setting of the book is 3,400 years ago. The setting of the book is 3,400 years ago. I want to read just from the, uh, just in the first chapter of the book, uh, just verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 of Numbers. It simply starts this way. The Lord spoke to Moses, it says in chapter 1, verse 1. Moses lived approximately 3,500 years ago, real person. And the Lord is speaking to him. It says, in the tent of meeting, <clears throat> in the desert of Sinai, on the first day of the second month of the second year, after the Israelites came out of Egypt. Notice we're being giving, given a historical reference marker. It does not say in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> it doesn't say in a time long, long ago. It tells us a real person, Moses, a real place you can visit today, the desert of Sinai, and it gives us real dates. <clears throat> In the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. So this is about two years after the emancipation of the nation of Israel from Egyptian slavery. That's the time setting of the book of Numbers. Again, it's the fourth book of the Bible. It's early history of the nation of Israel. Moses is most likely the author. Secondly, as a guide to understanding the book, uh, the name of the book refers to counting of people. You might wonder, how did this book get this name? There's a lot of counting that goes on. There's census taking, taking place in this book. Just go to the second verse of the first chapter. Uh, the Lord says in verse 2, <clears throat> Take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listing every man by name, one by one. Then verse 3, you and Aaron are to count, according to the divisions, all the men in Israel who are 20 years old or more and able to serve in the army. We find a massive census being taken place or taking place in the first chapter. Also, at the end of the book, there's another census taken, directed by the Lord. So a lot of the chapters within this book are simply recording the, the counting of the people. So there were 12 family groups or tribes, and they each had leaders of these families, and there's uh, subgroups of families. Those are recorded within this book at the Lord's direction. So that is one reason it's called the book of Numbers. Because of all the census taking, taking place that was for a purpose. A third guide to understand the book. The laws in the book were for the pre-Jesus nation of Israel. The laws in the book are for the pre-Jesus nation of Israel. You don't want to pick up the book of Numbers and then start going to chapter 5 and start to try to keep all these purity laws. Not everything in the book of Numbers is to be kept today. In fact, it was originally given to the nation of Israel, and even then for a limited period of time, as with all of the Old Covenant, till the time of the death of Jesus. But if we find principles in the Old Testament repeated in the New Testament for early Christians, then those principles should be kept. But some laws, especially some of the purification laws, the special uh, observance day laws, uh, other laws concerning the social community of Israel, just for Israel. So don't start picking up things in chapter 5 and 6 and other chapters and saying, okay, i got to start doing these things. No, <laughs> it was for Israel. But there are things that are cited in the New Testament from this book that are to be recognized today. So the laws in the book were for the pre-Jesus nation of Israel. Uh, the fourth guiding principle, the events of the book are real. The events of the book of uh, Numbers are real, very real. You have real people such as Moses, the most prominent individual, uh, individual by the name of Joshua, Caleb are introduced within this book. Uh, Moses' sister Miriam is cited. Uh, Moses' brother Aaron is cited. You have this individual by the name of Balaam that is cited. 
And they are cited in the New Testament. Events within the book of Numbers are cited by Jesus himself. Most notably, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 13, he speaks about as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So I myself will be lifted up, as he alludes to his impending crucifixion. But he refers to this event in the book of Numbers as a real event. Just as Moses did something, he himself, Jesus, will be lifted up. He's not citing fiction. He's not citing some fairy tale or myth. He's citing a real event to talk about his own real event. The most significant event of all history, that is the death of Jesus Christ. He uses a real event to prefigure it. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul, one of the most prominent people in the Bible, wrote 13 of its letters in the New Testament, cited events within the book of Numbers, specifically what we're going to talk about today. Thank you, Nathaniel. Cited very real events. And those events come from the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is never treated in scriptures just some fictional story that evolved over time. But trust that you're reading real events that happened in the nation of Israel. The fifth guide to understanding the book is to know that the application of the book is timeless. Even though the events happened <clears throat> excuse me, 3,400 years ago, the application of the book is timeless. Just like with the shuttle disaster or 9-11, we don't stop learning lessons about what happened with those disasters just one year after they happened. <clears throat> Engineers today will learn lessons from what happened with the shuttle. Uh, people that do security within the United States will continue to learn lessons from 9-11 throughout all of our future about the importance of diligence and seeing that sometimes a greatest threat can from be from within and how that those are seeking to do harm will be very patient and strike at just the right time. These are lessons that are timeless for our country and lessons from the book of Numbers are timeless for Christians today. Even 500 years after the main event of the book of Numbers, the writer of Psalm chapter 95 cites Numbers chapters 13 and 14. He cites it because it was still relevant for the nation of Israel. <coughs> then a thousand years later, a thousand years later, the Apostle Paul, who's most likely the writer of Hebrews, cites events from Psalm 95 that refer back to Numbers 13 and 14. A thousand years later. So within Scripture, there's continued application that come from this event 3,400 years ago. The event has application to fellow believers. And we'll see that at the very end of the lesson. We'll see where we're directly told, you've got to learn the lesson from what happened. Go ahead and look now in Scripture to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. I want to read through Numbers 13 and 14, but I'm going to try to do so as expeditiously as I can. But this is the key event. This is the event that is cited in Psalm 95, uh, cited in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, cited in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4 as a warning for God's people for all time, but especially for Christians. We're going to break down Numbers chapter 13 and 14 into five scenes. The first is reconnaissance. The second is report. The third is response. The fourth is recrimination. And the fifth is reconfiguration. Yes, they all start with R's to help us remember the power of these scenes. Let's just start reading chapter 13, verse 1. Here the nation of Israel has traveled through the Sinai Desert. It's about two years from the time they were delivered from Egyptian slavery. <clears throat> and they've come to the edge of what is called the promised land, 
or the land of Canaan. They're exactly where they should be. And they're on the verge of coming into this land that God had promised their forefather Abraham. They were going to leave the desert and go into this land where they're going to find it full of everything they knew, or need, I'm sorry, to grow crops, to prosper and settle down. It will be a land that will belong to them. God will drive out the people that live there, that do not belong there. And he will give it to his people Israel. He's carried them through the desert, taking on their enemies and supplying all that they need. They're right at the verge of going in. But we're going to see that what God intended never materialized. Chapter 13, verse 1. Go ahead and read this with me. We'll first see a reconnaissance mission. Verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving the Israelites. For each ancestral tribe send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. These are their names. From the time of Reuben, Shemuel, son of Zakur, From the tribe of Simeon, Shapat, son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jubapeth. From the tribe of Issachar, Igal, son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, son of Rapul. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, son of Sodai. From the tribe of Manasseh, a tribe of Joseph, Gadai, son of Sush, or Sushi. Or Susi, that's probably the right way to say it. Uh, verse 12, from the tribe of Dan, Emil, son of Gamali. From the tribe of Asher, Sethur, son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nebi, son of Vopshi. From the tribe of Gad, Gaul, son of Maki. Verse 16. These are the names of the men Moses sent to, notice this word now, explore. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. <clears throat> Verse 17. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go through the Negev. And on into the hill country. See what the land is like. And whether the people who live there are strong or weak. Few or many. What kind of land do they live in? <clears throat> is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land... It was a season for the first ripe grapes. Verse 21. So they went up, and here's that word, explore. Explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Libo Hamath. They went through the Negev and came to the Hebron where Abinam, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, live. Hebron had been built several years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the land of Eshcol, they cut off a branch. <clears throat> they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole. Between them, along with some pomegranates and figs, the place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israels cut off there. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So this is reconnaissance. God tells them, just go check out the land. Go see what's there. He doesn't tell them, go get in a fight. He just wants them to check it out. Check out the uh, fertile nature of the soil, what's growing there. Also, check out the people. He doesn't, doesn't tell them why. He just says, just do it. <laughs> and they do it. Twelve men go out. That's reconnaissance. Now we'll look at report. We'll see what they said when they came back as far as what they found. Verse 26 through 33. When they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran, there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. When we went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey... 
Here's its fruit. Verse 28 now. This is the beginning of trouble. Verse 28. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live, <coughs> excuse me, the Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Verse 30. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. <clears throat> All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. Think about these words. The report of at least 10, or only 10, I should say, is it simply, yeah, it's a great land, but there's some huge people living there. And we felt like we were grasshoppers in their sight. Now, those people never said they're grasshoppers. They just say, we felt like grasshoppers. We felt like it. They're too powerful. We can't do that. And these words here that stick out the greatest they say they are stronger than we. Consider how the Lord heard that. His own people saying, these people, just because they're taller and they have some weapons, they're stronger than we are. This is a completely faithless assessment of themselves. Even Caleb interrupts these ten guys mid-sentence to say, hey, we can do this. If you've ever been around a negative Nelly, a, half, a glass half empty person, you probably have insight into this. Someone that can never see how something can be done. Someone that sees a problem behind every bush. <laughs> They're never leaders of the place you work. They're never people you want to work in a group project with. <laughs> because they never see the potential, only the problem. Now, sometimes that can be good. We need people to recognize problems. But not when you, the potential is right there and you have God on your side to say, no, we can't do it even with God on our side. But that's what these ten are saying. Let's look now at the response of the nation when they hear this report. Starting with chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. Here's how the nation of Israel hears this report from the ten. Again, Joshua and Caleb will say, hey, we can do this. Ten say we can't. Verse 1, chapter 14. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, to catch this. This is probably the, one of the most painful words of Scripture. If we only had died in Egypt... <coughs> Or in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. That's the response. Hey, you, the Lord just took us out here to kill us. We can't do this. We, we should have died in Egypt. And we even want to go back. That means go back to enslavement. Go back to where they were in Egyptian slavery for years. they rather do that than try to take on the challenge with God of going into the promised land. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Junipeth, were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes, and said to the entire Israelite assembly, 
The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of us. That's what Joshua is saying. The Lord is with us. But the ten men that went with him, or at least ten of them, are saying, no, we can't do this. They're too big. They're too powerful. And they don't even think the Lord will be on their side. <coughs> Verse 10. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that performed for them or among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a greater and stronger. I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. We're going to skip one section. Actually, let's just go into it. I was going to, for time's sake, miss it, but let's just go right into it. Verse 13. Verse 13, here's the Lord's continued response to the people. First, he's going to just wipe them all out. He's had enough. But verse 13, Moses responds back to the Lord and says, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of the land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people, and you, Lord, have seen face to face, have been seen face to face, and that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death all at one time, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, The Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you've declared. This is Moses talking to God. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Verse 19, chapter 14. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Let's just pause here. Moses is telling the Lord, don't do this. The other nations will hear that you could not bring them in. Please forgive them of what they've done. <clears throat> Verse 20. Verse 20. This is part of the Lord's re response, or this is the recrimination. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you ask. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors." No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went into, and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, verse 26, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has grumbled in the census, who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home except Caleb, son of Junipeth, and Joshua, son of Nun. 
As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness, your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness, until the last of your bodies lie in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year, for each of the 40 days, you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to the whole wicked community, which is banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness where they will die. This is the key event of the book of Numbers. In one of the most tragic scenes of all of Scripture, the very people that had been led out of Egypt to go into a land that God would give them as their own, where their families could settle, they would drive their enemies out, and they would live at peace, and they would live in prosperity. They got right to the edge, and out of a lack of faith, a lack of trust, and eventually disobedience, they refused to go in, they rebelled against God. God says, you're not going in. This generation that rebelled against me will wander going back into the desert for 40 years. One year for every day <clears throat> the reconnaissance group was there in the land checking it out. One year for every day, which would be 40. That generation will live in the wilderness till that first generation dies. But instead, the Lord is going to bring their children into the land. But don't lose sight of this one point. Those that God intended to go are not going to be going at all. They will die in the wilderness. I want to end today by looking at the message for us today. Two messages. First of all, the warning. We want to look at how this applies to us today. I want to look now in our closing moments of the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Chapters 3 and 4 refer extensively to this scene in Numbers 13 and 14. They do, throw, do so through the book of Psalm, chapter 95, which talks about this event. And here the book of Hebrews in the New Testament is written to early Christians who are tempted to make the same mistake. In lack of faith, fall away from the faith they have in Jesus Christ. Verse 1 beginning, first three verses. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to fallen short of it. For we also have the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Well, what's he referring to here in chapter 4? He's referring back to the group in chapter 3, which is the very group that Moses was intending to lead in to Israel. Chapter 3, verse 16. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? I'm in chapter 3, verse 17. And who was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that he would never, they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? We see then that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Here the writer of Hebrews is directly citing the events of Numbers 13 and 14. And telling Christians of that day, don't turn away from your faith in God, which is through Jesus Christ. Because that is the temptation in the book of Hebrews. They want to go back to the Jewish laws. They want to go back to the security of the Jewish sacrificial system. Because they're starting to be persecuted for their faith. But the writer of Hebrews says, don't do that. Don't make that mistake. 
You stay with the Lord, stay with His Son Jesus. That is the only way out of this world. That is the only way out of your problem with sin. And that is the only way of going to heaven. And being with their God eternally. The scene of Numbers 13 and 14 is a warning. Don't lose your faith. Don't fall away. And that message for us today. If we leave today, if we leave in this life our faith in Jesus Christ, there is no other hope. There is no other path to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And if people just abandon that after becoming Christians, after being baptized into Jesus Christ, the writer saying there is no hope. <clears throat> but the second message for us today is this, and then we'll close. The way to the promised land today, which is our heaven, our promised land is heaven, is through sustained faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, I want to go to verse 14. Chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 14. The writer says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, that we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Even though we have times of difficulty, our faith falters, we commit sins we never intended, the answer is not to give up and abandon our faith. The answer is to turn to Jesus. As John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must sustain our faith in Jesus Christ. That is our only hope. But if we abandon it, if we give up and go back into the world and say, ah, this faith is too much, this Christianity is too difficult, none of my friends are Christians, it's too, it's too hard, we will lose the promised land, which means we will lose heaven. And we'll receive just the opposite, just like the children or nation of Israel did. The book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Our challenge this morning is to maintain our faith. Keep on praying to the Lord every day. Keep on meeting with other Christians so that your faith might be sustained. Don't give up. Don't let repeated sins in your life or overwhelming difficulties make you think it's just not worth it being a Christian. It is hard. But if you abandon Christ, it will be far harder. And you'll lose everything. Scripture is very clear, and that's why this event is cited so frequently and so extensively in the New Testament. As we close this morning, our challenge is to be faithful. Don't give up. In the throes of World War II, Winston Churchill said to the people of Great Britain, never, never, never give up. And that is our call today. Perhaps you've never started. You can put your faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. It's the only hope. If you want to learn more about that hope today, and you want to have confidence that you will be good with God forever, contact us here at the Lake Merced Church, and we'll show you more about how you do that. You can be baptized into Jesus Christ, putting your faith in Him instead of yourself. And have confidence that God will see you through to the end. The choice is yours, just as it was for Israel. Choose well. Learn from others. And make the right choice in your own life. Thank you for your attention today. And may God bless you as you go forward.